welcome to Category Theory, the beginner's introduction. I am Martin Cottington, and this is Lesson 1, Video 6 of 6. Last time, we learned how to calculate the number of maps between sets, and we agreed to use the symbol, the size of b to the power of a, to represent the number of maps from a to b. We also got our first introduction to universal mapping properties by exploring the terminal object and initial object in S. This led us to contemplate the reason for duality. Why could we simply reverse the arrow in the definition of the initial object to get a new definition, the terminal object? This led us to look at maps from a different perspective and led to the realization that every category has a mirror category or opposite category, C up, where the objects are the same as C, but for each arrow F from A to B in C, there is this a corresponding arrow F up from B to A in C up that describes the same arrow, but from a different perspective. We said that in S up, maps are best thought of in terms of splittings rather than clusterings, and that the order of assignment in maps matters if we wanted to. We saw that the terminal object of S was the initial object of S op and vice versa. Today we will take a closer look at the terminal object in S. I will give you a glimpse of how it will make your life easier in the future, both in understanding concepts in the theory and improving them. Definition 1-4. In any category C, point of an object X is a map 1 to X. What are the points of sets? Well, 1 in S is the one element set, so a map x0 bar from 1 to x must take this unique element to some element of x. Let's call it x0. So x0 bar of dot is equal to x0. So in S, the points are the elements of the set. In other words, maps 1 to x tell us everything we need to know about a set. This implies, as we shall begin to see today, that everything about sets can be phrased in the language of category theory. Demonstrating this will show that category theory can be applied to any practical problem, because there's not much that is not based on sets in the real world. So we've been informally speaking of a set A as being equal to A0, A1, A2, and this was a necessary simplification, which we will still use in discussion, but you will shortly see the benefits of using a more formal way in proofs, which is to describe the set A by its three unique points, A0, 1 to A, A1, 1 to A, and A2, 1 to A. I should point out that it's not always the case in every category that objects consist solely of points. In fact, this is very rare. In dynamical systems, points are steady states. In permutations, cycles of length 1. In graphs, loops. But there will always be some small collection of objects in any category, usually between 1 and 3, for many of the categories we will use, that will give all the information about an arbitrary object in that category. Now we can give a formal notion of the size of a set. Definition 1, 6. The size of a set X is represented by the number of unique maps 1 to X. The full benefit of these definitions will become clear in Lesson 2 as we begin to explore more universal mapping properties and discuss the types of maps. But let's use them right now to prove a couple concepts we've been using from the beginning. Let's say that we have the following function f from A to B. If we look, for example, at A0, we see that f of A0 is equals to B0. But we just learned that A0 is actually a map 1 to A. So we have the partial triangle, which the composition law tells us that we can complete to form the composite f following A0, which must equal to B0. This shows us that evaluation is a special case of composition. In other words, f of A0 is equals to f following A0. We have been using this idea since we defined composition. We said that g following f of a is equals to g of f of a. Now we can prove it. So g following f of a is equals to g following f following a because we just showed that f of a is equal to f following a. And g following f following a is equals to g following f following a because of associativity we can put parentheses anywhere. And g following f following a is equals to g following b, because f following a is equals to some b in b. And g following b is equals to g of b, again we just showed this, and g of b is equals to g of f of a. We also can give a succinct formal proof that the identity arrow is indeed the arrow for which 1a of a is equal to a. First note that we can specify an entire function as a series of commutative triangles. For example, the F illustrated is represented by these three triangles. 
which means that we can say, in general, from the arbitrary A and A, there exists a unique triangle with exactly one B, I, and B. We can actually use this for the definition of an S map if we desire. Now remember we said that identity law can be represented by the following commutative diagram. Let's connect our function commutative diagram in two places, at the top and the bottom. Our proof can now be stated as follows. This diagram commutes. Since the diagram commutes, all the paths between objects are interpreted as the same map. But if we wanted to give additional equations, we could give equations that show that F satisfies the identity law and that 1A of A is the identity arrow. And this can be seen from reading the relations from the two paths to A and the two paths to B. But this wasn't necessary. All we needed to say is that the diagram commutes. More succinctly, if we remove the repeated elements and functions from the diagram, we get this equivalent diagram, which I think is pretty cool. Basically, the definition of a function in S, that's what this diagram represents, illustrates composition, associativity, the identity of the identity arrow, and the identity laws. Basically, we can prove that S is a category by simply saying that this diagram commutes and that sets consist solely of points. And this is the interesting thing about the axioms in category theory. They are literally part of every construction in the theory. But you already knew what the identity of the identity arrow was, so maybe this proof wasn't terribly exciting. But if you can understand and follow this trivial proof, you will be able to understand all the proofs we will do in this first section. All the concepts we will use for proofs are the axioms. Composition, associativity, and the identity laws. And we will use maps from the terminal object, since points are all sets consist of, and commutative diagrams. As hard as it may be to believe, we will get through most of S using just these few techniques. And this is what makes category theory so beautiful. Towards the end of section 1, when you have become more familiar with category theory, I will introduce some concepts from logic that we will need for some more complex proofs we will do about S, about sets of an endomorphism, and an abstract category theory in section 2. But I would like to discuss one more thing about the terminal object before we end. It's a subtle point, but one that will have huge consequences for us. Remember we said that limits are objects L, possibly with zero or more maps to other objects, such that for all objects X in the category, there's a unique map X to L, such that the diagram L may be a part of commutes. So the definition of the terminal object implies that we can construct a category from the base category in which L is defined, where L is the terminal object. This can sometimes be very useful, as it will help us to understand that limit because the new category was defined using it. This will especially be useful when we define our own limits, and we will see this in action in Lesson 3. We've only begun to explore category theory. If this were a category theory book, we would still be on page 1. But notice that, as of now, we are not bringing any baggage from set theory with us. We have explicitly defined every concept about sets we will use. Elements, size, function evaluation, and composition. In the next lesson, we will discuss general concepts about maps and diagrams. Specifically, determination and choice problems, which will lead into our discussion of monic, epic, and iso arrows, equalizers and co-equalizers, pullbacks and pushouts. There will also be a special reflection video of this lesson after I've had a little time to interact with you to see how the material of the lesson was received. And in that video, now that we have been introduced to some concepts in category theory, I will discuss some of the philosophical questions. Why should you learn category theory? What the precise format of our discussion will take? And what are the, our goals with the software project? There will also be a video introducing the problem set for this lesson. What I hope to have accomplished is to have introduced you to, to have given you a glimpse of the categorical way of thinking, and to interest you in wanting to continue to learn more about this revolutionary theory. I hope I've succeeded. See you next time.